Living by Design with host Kathy Holloway Hill. Kathy is a strong, powerful voice. She entertains, informs, and inspires her audiences everywhere she goes. Holloway Hill and welcome to the Living by Design show. If you grew up in the 60s and 70s, then you know who was the it girl. This iconic, legendary, beautiful guest has accomplished more in her life than many, many, many people combined. She is gorgeous, one of the world's most beautiful people, not only on the outside, but also on the inside. And it is my absolute pleasure to welcome to the show the legendary, the one and only Miss Jane Kennedy Overton. You're going to make me get a big head. <laughs> but thank you so much. I, I truly appreciate you taking the time to interview me, to include me within your show, Kathy. It's an honor. So I, I feel very blessed. Thank you. We're both very blessed, Jane. And, uh, and I thank you for that. It is my pleasure because I have been a fan of yours for many, many, many years. Uh, you just handle yourself with such grace and just just you just glide and you float and <laughs> Miss Ohio. I mean, breaking glass ceilings. You were the first African American Miss Ohio, and then in the top ten. Well, no, but, to, the first to win. There was actually a Miss Ohio before me. Um, she was the first runner up, and mm -hmm. when the winner was then disqualified, the one that was the first runner up became Miss Ohio. So I was the first to win the title but wow. there is you know give her her props <laughs> give her her give her her props and jane you were actually the first african-american top 10 contestant in the miss usa pageant is that correct uh yes there there are different like compartments within the pageant and yes i was in the top 10 so yeah wow so, yes. so i was in the that was in the top 15 overall mm -hmm. um and then in the top 10 in swimsuit competition. Okay. So, and then a lot of, I've seen a lot of stories where they say, you know, she was in the top five, which is not true. Um, yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of, there are a lot of um, people who think they know me, but they really don't. They think they know the story, but they really don't. Um, so that's often funny to me, <laughs> but um, it's still an honor. And I, I'm so glad you said that because when you, have the legendary background and the status that you possess people come up with all kinds of things well she yes. accomplished this and she did that and she didn't do this and she didn't do that and most of the time they're always wrong so I'm so glad you're setting the record straight now let's also set the, set the record straight for you have been inducted into some halls not <laughs> the hall but a few halls of fame. Talk about that, please. Well, I think um, the, probably the most important one to me at this point in my life, um, when I when I became a member of the uh, desk of the NFL Today, that was huge. You know, no way would I have ever envisioned that that would ever happen in my life. Um, and um, through a lot of struggle and uh, a lot of naysayers, I was able to manage to, to be there. Um, but um, the journalists weren't, the sports journalists were not willing to accept that. Um, first of all, it was a woman and there was one prior to me, there was Phyllis George um, yeah. and um, I replaced her. And so the, all the people, the sports journalists, I mean, you have to remember there were only three networks back then. There were yeah. no streaming networks. There were no other, there were no podcasts. There was nothing that you could have opportunities to broadcast as a broadcast medium. Um, so to be on one of the top three shows was 
iconic. And the CBS NFL Today was the number one show. So that was that was pretty amazing. But um, the sports journalist who were writing in the newspaper, um, you know, like I never spoke with anyone, but it was always that um, they kind of resented on air talent because they had to wait for their stories to be told in the Monday morning news. Um, whereas we were able to put the news on air as it happened. Um, and oftentimes post, but a lot of times we were able to put news on as it happened. So um, there were the, there were a lot of journalists that didn't, you know, that felt that they should be the ones to have an opportunity to be an on-air broadcaster, not a girl, not a girl who had never been involved as a sports journalist, never a girl that hadn't been a, a journalist, and certainly not a Black girl. <laughs> on top of that. So there were a lot of journalists that did not like um, the fact that I was there. And um, things like uh, one journalist had been cleared by the PR department at CBS to interview me on set. And I was very excited about it, you know, and he spent a couple of hours on the set. He did an interview, uh, he followed me around, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, when it came out, there was no part of my interview, there was no part of what I actually did on air that was in his in, in what he wrote. What he wrote was that I disrespected my job because I came to the set wearing jeans and no, no shoes. That was 1978. I started in Hollywood in 1971. You can ask anybody that knew me. I always wore, I was always in jeans and I never wore shoes. I hated wearing shoes. So, you know, that wasn't like something that was new and showing disrespect. That was me and that was him not allowing me to be me. Um, and he, he was saying that I disrespected my job because I didn't wear shoes on the set and because I wore jeans. Well, we just dress, you know, you dress from the top, from the waist up. You know, nobody saw what was under the desk. People do it all the time today. And especially today, you know, jeans is top stuff, top notch wardrobe at this point. But, some uh, some jeans cost more than hey, an entire outfit. Absolutely. So, you know, if you want to say I was ahead of my time again, <laughs> I was another first. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know. And I don't really care, you know, but it's just I just find it funny that people had so many reasons to dislike me. So then 40 years go by, I get a call um, and it's from the National Association of Sports Media. And uh, they wanted to give me an award um, that was the Rune Arledge Award. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage our 2022 Rune Arledge Award winner for innovation, Jane Kennedy. Now, if you know sports, you know Rune Arledge was legendary. And he was the one that created Monday Night Football. That didn't exist before Rune Arledge came along. So they gave me an award for innovation for the work that I did in the sport broadcast industry. So to be able to go to this event, which was in North Carolina last summer, um, and actually have all these sports journalists on the floor and they're standing up, and they're applauding. But um, it was, I just, I was so nervous because I had worked so hard, you know, to just get the job to begin with and yes. to keep it. Um, and then, and to never be acknowledged. And now I feel like, you know, I can take a breath because it finally did come. Yes, absolutely. And and you know what I have to say about that is, I I know what you went through. I, I was in a, a, a corporate job, male dominated technology industry. And so with you being in that industry, being male dominated, white male dominated, and you being an African-American female, could you just share with the younger viewers? Because the reason I'm, I'm asking this question is because I feel like our younger generations are a little bit entitled and they have no idea some of the things that we went through back in the 70s and 80s being oh, in, in an industry where you're not want it you're not valued you're not appreciated you're just tolerated and you know kind of share how that made you feel and 
what did you do to overcome it? Because I know you didn't stay in conflict with everyone or you wouldn't have received an award that you so well deserved. Thank you. I did. I do feel that um, a lot of today's youth feel entitled, but I don't think it comes from a personal character trait. I think it comes from a societal trait. Um, yes. because that's what this country is about now. Um, and yes. I'm, I'm not speaking for other countries. I'm speaking for what I see in the United States. Yes. Um, it was a different, it was a different time back then. I remember um, um, one of the things that I'm most proud of that nobody knows, I was actually, um, before Kamala Harris, I was vice president of the United States. What? But it was Girls Nation. <laughs> But still, Girls Nation is a, um, uh, a a program. They have centers in every state, so they would have these programs where the the high schools would nominate. In our in our instance, they nominated six girls to go to girl state and six boys to go to boy state. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you were supposed to learn the political system. What and a two week program at a college campus. So I'm raised in Ohio, so I'm on the bus headed to Athens University. And um, um, uh, one of my classmates says, Jane, you should run for governor. And I said, no, <laughs> why? Why would I do that? They said, because you can win. And then, then the other four girls, they're jumping up and down and they're going, yeah, you should do this. You should do this. So I got to you know university and I, I did run for governor. I lost, um, but you, you, you run, you campaign for the first week. And then the second week, you actually do the work that you were elected for. That's the, basically the program. So at the end of the second week, everybody there voted for um, two senators to go to um, Washington, D.C. as a senator from the state of Ohio. I was one of the two elected. So I got to D.C. and I met this girl. Her name was Rowan Costin from Boston, Massachusetts. And we clicked very well with our thoughts and our um, policies. And we decided that we were going to run for president and vice president. And um, we, we won. And our, our political party was called Interabang, ask questions and then come with power. So it was called Interabang and um, we won. It was just after um, Dr. King had been assassinated. So a lot of what I believed about what needed to be fixed was watching him, watching him yeah. make this country acknowledge what African-Americans go through. Um, but, um, you know, I, I was sworn into office by um, uh, Vice President Spiro T. Agnew. And I actually, um, we met in the actual Senate chambers. And because it's the Senate, you know, the Vice President basically runs the Senate. So not the, not the President. So I got to run the Senate for the, the, the second week that we were there. Um, and when I went to, um, they took us on a tour of the Smithsonian. And I was able to see all the exhibits and I learned more about history than I ever did when I was in school. But it's sort of, this is a full circle that goes back to the other question that you asked me because I didn't think that things like that were possible, certainly for a black girl. But my yeah. parents raised me to never set limits on who you are and what your dreams are. Yeah. Um, but when I'm stood in the Smithsonian, I'm seeing all of these exhibits and I was just in awe and I couldn't believe that here I was vice president of the United States, right? And I never thought that they, a day would come in, um, well, I don't know how many are the years later, I think it was in 2019, I get an email, um, no, it was an Instagram message. And this guy that I did know, one of my followers, he said, look what I found today. And he sent me a picture. He had gone to the Smithsonian Museum of African-American History and Culture when it had first opened. And there was a picture of me on the wall in the Smithsonian. And I said, where did you get that? He said, he said, no, it's, in, it's hanging in the Smithsonian. And, you know, so I'm talking to him back and forth. And he had taken it. It was like on the wall with Don Cornelius, um, Diana Ross and the Supremes, Michelle Nichols, wow. Diane Carroll, Nat King Cole, and then me at the very end. So, wow. you know, there's all these pictures on the wall. And I said, dang, I wish you had taken it from the other perspective so that I can actually see my photo on the wall. 
Next day, he he called me back. I mean, he hit me up again and he said, I went back. I got the picture for you. And he had taken it from the other end and he sent it to me. So, I mean, to from the small town girl that came from Wycliffe, Ohio, who never believed that all of these possibilities would ever come true. But I had parents that taught me to believe. I came from an era there where there were the political assassinations, um, uprisings, burn your bra, um, anti-Vietnam protests, um, Black Panthers, all of that, the uprising of the 60s um, was embedded in me. And it yes. made me believe that, hmm, okay, I yes. need that too. <laughs> yes. And I, yeah. I think that's all you need. You only need that push that someone, and sometimes seeing is believing, representation matters. So when you, and for the young people that I tell today, when you see someone that can do something that you don't even know it's a dream of yours. As a matter of fact, I wrote something down because I viewed one of your, um, one of, and I, I taped this to my hairspray bottle so that I wouldn't forget it. <laughs> Let me get my glasses off. <laughs> Because this is what, you know, a lot of people say, I want to grow up and I want to be this, 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 and this. And I wrote down here, don't be so determined to find your purpose your way that you roadblock your purpose from finding you. Oh, I love that. And that's that's what I believe. That's what I believe. It, you know, I want every young person, every person who's listening to remember that Jane, I'm going to ask you to repeat that one more time. With pleasure. Oh, Don't be so determined to find your purpose, your way. You roadblock your purpose from finding you. Mm, that is deep and powerful. Just like you. I have been, I have been blessed by so many things that I never sought. But they happened anyway. And yes. they were blessings. Um, as a woman sitting on the desk of the NFL today, you don't think that um, there's any way that you can start a family as a female sports broadcaster. You can't be pregnant on the sideline. You can't be pregnant in a broadcast booth. You're going to get fired. You know, yep. so there were things that um, many reasons why I had delayed having a family. I was always on the road. I was always traveling, always gone. Um, so many opportunities had come my way that that I hadn't thought to even seek so many things that I sought that I didn't get later. I said, God, thank you for not letting me get that. Cause that movie is horrible. You know? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so Amen. I, I, believed, I believe in trusting life and instinct and intuition and God. And I think that that has led me to um, some of the greatest blessings that I could have ever had because I didn't think about having children in, in 1982. And I came down, I'd never been sick before, and I came down with endometriosis. And I had, um, which is a disease on the outside of the uterine wall, scar tissue builds up. Extremely mm -hmm. painful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here I am trying to figure out what am I going to do next? I'd never been sick and I get endometriosis. A lot of people didn't even know what it was back then. I went to right. doctors here and there, different states. I had all kinds of laser laparoscopy surgical procedures. Nobody could come up with anything. And there is no, there was no cure. My doctor all, all of a sudden one day, he said, you know, Jane, there is one thing that works. It's not a cure, but it does work. And I said, what's that? I'll, I'll try anything. He said, pregnancy. And I said, okay, God, I got the message. Wow. And that's when I started my family. God may not come in the way that you asked for him to. But he will show up and show out. On time. He, he does. It's amazing. You know, Jane, if, I know you're probably, if, if you're not, I, I hope you are going to be soon, in the process of writing your autobiography, memoirs, something. I am. Yes, I'm, I completed it. I started in 2020 at my, I mean, you know, here it is. Oh, no, no, no. Let me, let me go back. I started in the year 2000. So it's taking me 22 years to finish it. That's but, okay. Uh, 
I started it at my mom and dad's 50th wedding anniversary. They, um, they did a big celebration. And so many people had told me, Jane, you need to write a book. You need to write a book. And my sister that night pulled me to the side and she said, Jane, you need to write a book. Um, and so I started, you know, and at first I didn't know where I wanted it to go. I didn't know what the message was going to be. I was still waiting on God to tell me what was my purpose. I had two incident, two near death incidents. And my mom kept telling me that's because it's not your time. You haven't found your purpose yet. Mm. I kept looking for my purpose, you know? And so I didn't know what the end of the book was going to be, but I just wanted to get it out of my heart, get it out of my soul, get it out of my head. And so I just started writing just anywhere piece of toilet paper on an airplane. I would just write and just compile. Um, yeah. And so eventually um, I came into a roadblock and I didn't write for maybe eight years. Um, but during that time, I'd been struggling with a lot of things and I decided that there was only one way for me to go forward was to learn how to forgive myself even mm -hmm. though I felt that I wasn't at blame, I think that no matter whatever happens to you in life, you are at blame at some point. Um, and so I said, you know, if I can't forgive myself, I can't go forward. Yes. And I looked for a way to do that. I couldn't find it. Yes. And um I had gone to several churches. I talked to several different ministers. I still couldn't find my answer. Yes. And I was driving down the street, um, going to the market, and it was dark out. And I saw this tiny church on the side, and there was a glow coming out of the front doors. They were open. Church only held about probably 20 people. And there was a choir practicing that night. And as I'm driving by, and this is a fairly large, it's called an avenue for a reason. It was large. Um, causeway and so I flip around I go over there I run in and the minister is up there the choir director is there and there's about eight people in this choir and they're singing right and I just felt like I needed to speak with the minister and I did and I waited for everybody to leave and we spoke and he said I need you to let's 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 set up some appointments and we can talk about this and um, maybe three months we met regularly and um, I finally got to the point where I felt at peace which I love that which was big for me um and I went back to tell him and the church was gone and he was gone and I've never seen him again really the church was gone the doors were locked wow nobody knew where the congregation went nobody knew where the minister went they were in my life for a moment in time that I really needed it. And so Absolutely. once again. Once and that again, was divine intervention. That was not an accident. That's why I'm saying don't stand in the way of yes. your purpose finding you. That is correct. Oh, my goodness. So many times all these young people, they have goals and hopes. And, um, yes. They get disappointed yeah. when they don't get it or they get redirected yeah. or whatever, you know. But my dad used to always say um, that his mother taught him one thing that he carried forward. He said, people often hold tight onto things that they hold dear. They hold mm -hmm. so tight and they never open their hands for fear of losing it. He mm -hmm. said, but when you have to take something, when you have to get something, you got to open your hands. If you stay with your hands closed, you'll never get that. And he says, be willing to dare to be willing to say, might take a long time to open those hands. Yes. Yes. But it might be just what you need. Now, Jane, I, I have to ask you this question. And uh, I'm going to apologize up front because I know you've been asked this question a million times. Your beauty, has it been a curse or a blessing? Gosh. Oh, gosh, I'm crying. <laughs> um, you have mirrors, I, so I'm sure you know you're beautiful. Stunning. But I, <laughs> but I don't think of it. Um, and I think that might be the difference. Um, 
So you haven't noticed over your career, over your no, lifetime? I didn't, I didn't say I didn't say I didn't notice. I don't. Okay. Think on it. I don't think on it. I don't. I, you won't find me trying to be my most beautiful self. I'm. I'm really I know. Into authentic. I'm, I can clearly see that, but we know what others see. So because I'm sort of like, a, um, <laughs> I'm not an outgoing person. Um, so you wouldn't find me like at parties and hanging out. And mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very outgoing in my pursuit of my career. But right. I think that that sort of maybe overwhelmed my personality. So because I had to be strong and forward and thoughtful and accomplished, mm -hmm. when I wasn't doing my career, I was just me. And that's why the book is called Plain Jane. Wow. Because that's, that's who I am. I'm not the people that you saw in the media, you know, like even though I, I've always been very open and, and because I've been authentic, people do know a lot about me, but they don't yes. know what makes me tick, you know? The, and most people who don't know you have, and I know you have been, so I don't even have to ask. I know you get judged a lot based okay. on your external appearance. All the time. Uh, I mean, that is so they're, they're, unfair. And, that is, so that is so unfair. But I know it happened. A lot of where I can say that it was definitely an anchor. Um, my 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 looks were a, a definite a problem because I was oftentimes traveling by myself. Um, I didn't have you know I hardly got paid anything back then. They they weren't giving black people large paychecks. In right. the entertainment industry, um, you're the struggle bus was real. <laughs> yeah. So you know, like you don't you you don't weren't going out there buying glamorous gowns and th there was no makeup to find other than fashion fair, you know, uh, for black women. Yes. And um, so being glamorous and being seen was never part of the agenda, but um, because I was on the road often by myself. Um, I found myself, you know, you go down, you're in a hotel and you go down to the restaurant on the first floor, whatever, you know, and you go and you sit there and you order your meal. And all of a sudden guys are coming in. They want to sit with you. And I didn't, I didn't want to sit with a guy. I wanted to just sit down and have dinner. They don't buy that, you know? So then, you know, what's the answer? I ate in my room. So I would oftentimes just stay in my room. I remember I went to, um, it was Jackson, Mississippi, and I was going out for a jog and I put my clothes on, my sneakers, walking down in the, um, uh, one of the guys uh, in, the, in the lobby, one of the guys that worked there, um, he said, uh, Miss Kennedy, uh, he said, can I talk to you for a minute? I said, yeah, yeah, so fine, you know. He says, please don't go out there. And I said, why? He said, you're a beautiful black woman. You cannot walk these streets by yourself. He says, let me find someone to either walk with you or you need to stay in your room. And I you're going to get noticed because of your, your beauty and your height. Yeah, see, that's the thing. Because, you know, like I was talking to Oprah <laughs> about um, my book and what I should put in it and whatnot, you know, and she, by the, she said they had 20 minutes for me. And by the end of four hours, we were still talking. <laughs> wow. Well, I could believe she that. Said, she said, okay, so um, this book is long overdue and you need to write it. She said, but she said, the book that I really want to read, um, she said, this is not the book that I would want to read on you. She said, I want to know what is it like to walk into a room and be the most beautiful woman in the room? And she started going on and on and on about why it was important and why we needed to hear that story. Jennifer Lopez can't write that because she's current. Um, Beyonce can't write that because she's yeah. current. They might make them sound weird. Or she said, but yours is your past. You can talk about that. And she's going, I said, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me just stop you. <laughs> I said, I can't write that book because I've never thought that. She says, no, 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 you have to. She said, you know, you're, you're, you walk into a room and everybody turns and they look at you. And I said, 
I was often the only black woman in the room. They're going to turn and look. I was always 5'10 since I was fifth grade. They're going to turn and look at the tall black girl, that only one in the room. And I said, I was used to that. It wasn't like it didn't dawn on me that they're looking at me because I'm pretty or whatever. You know, like I didn't have a large wardrobe. My mom taught me how to sew when I was a kid. Almost everything that I made, even some of the things that I made that were on my movies, et cetera, I made myself. I'm doing, I did a show with David Hasselhoff and I'm wearing this drop dead gorgeous gown with a $4 million diamond necklace, yellow, yellow diamond necklace that one of the sponsors I brought in to put on my neck. And I'm wearing a gown that I made. You know, I thought that was amazing <laughs> that I'm wearing this gown, right? Um, and I just, you know, I just, my hair was always too frizzy. I didn't have designer clothes. I didn't do this. I didn't do that. I didn't fit in. Um, that's the way I, I always thought. Well, I, I have a, a, a different take on it. I, I mean, you probably didn't even notice. I noticed for a different reason because of the height. And uh, I can understand where Oprah was coming from with that question, where, where you're concerned, but you really didn't pay attention to that. Like, because like you said, I mean, you know, it really wasn't a lot of us. Uh, you're always the only black woman in the room. So it really didn't, didn't really dawn on you or even you didn't think about it. I didn't think about it. I have a picture of all in there. I have a picture of me. Um, um, gosh, I don't, I think it was in Manila, at the Thriller in Manila. Mm -hmm. And it was a press conference. Now, okay, Muhammad Ali. So you've got people from all over the world at this press conference, right? Mm -hmm. So it was this a single shot of him in the middle and just all of these journalists are leaning in, talking with microphones. And, and it was like an overhead shot. I was the only woman in the shot. Wow from all over the world. And so did oh, Muhammad no. Ali make sure that he talked directly to you? Oh, I'd known him already. Um, my, oh, or, okay, I got you. Yeah, got, okay. I knew him from before. That was, um, it was maybe 75. So, okay, mid 70s, okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And wow. I had met him maybe 72, 73. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So um, we were invited to, um, uh, Manila as part of his entourage so um, we all flew on the same plane to the Philippines we all stayed we had dinner at the president um, president uh, Fernando Marcos house um, and his wife of Melda she even showed us all the dozens and dozens of shoes in her her closet you know um, um, I don't know if you know you know she was like known for being the shoe yes. queen yeah yes so um no, but it was, it was an amazing, it was amazing, you know, and I, I remembered um, only one year after high school, I graduated in 70. So 1971, I remembered um, getting tickets to go to see him fight Joe Frazier in Madison Square Garden when it was on the Jumbotron, closed circuit TV. That's when that, all that was beginning. Mm -hmm. And um, they were showing it at uh, three different venues in Cleveland, Ohio. And um uh, the Leon and I had tickets for one of the venues and we were trying to get in, but there was like tuna in a can. It was so jammed and um, sardines in a can. That's what I should say. <laughs> sardines in a can. It was so packed and you could feel, you know, the crowd would push you, you know, to go this way and you go this way. You weren't walking. It's just the sway of the bodies and nobody was going anywhere. Finally, the word got back that um, they had oversold tickets at the venue and they weren't letting anybody in. So the people in the front of the line were pushing, trying to get out. People in the back of the line were pushing and trying to get in. We actually got pushed through a glass window. Um, I mean, it's ground floor, but we got pushed through a glass window. And um, I had one of those long maxi coats. You remember maxi coats? And they yes, were like yes. the frayed ones yes. with the fake fur on the bottom. So um, we... We ended up jumping a barbed wire fence. I took my maxi coat out, threw it over the fence. We called over the fence, went to another venue um, where Leon knew, some, knew somebody that was working backstage and we got in to watch it. 
So that was my first time that I'd actually gone to see a, an Ali fight in 1971. And here I was 1975 and I'm in his corner in, the, in Manila as part of his entourage. Wow. Mind blowing. Now tell me, did this high school girl set that as a goal? No. Exactly. That exactly. wasn't even on my bucket list. Yes, yes. So, you yes. know, that's why I'm saying there's so many blessings that come to you. Yes. You have to allow them to come your way. Amen. Now, Jane, I, I want to ask you, because there are a lot of young women, a lot of older women who have been married and divorced and they want to get married again. And for the younger women who've never been married, can you share a little bit of when you were in your first marriage, which we, we know was, was pretty toxic, when did you know in your spirit that it was time to move on? What was your heart telling you? We were married for 10 years. Um, I got married at 19. Mm -hmm. um, it's the first person I ever dated. My dad had five girls and he was making sure that all of them were taken care of. For okay. so we never dated you know never went out you know so this was this was a whole new idea to me <laughs> you know marriage mm -hmm. and being in love you know so there was and you say it, it was toxic it wasn't it wasn't always you know not until the end um yes, we did yes. Some amazing things together um exactly but, that's true that is so very true but yeah, but you 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 it. knew you knew when it changed but but what i was going to say is at that time Marriage was forever. Yes. You, you didn't get to a point where you said, I've had enough. That is you correct. You to the point where, oh my God, this is as much as I think I can bear. I don't know how I'm going to make it through another 50 years. That yep. was the mindset back then. It's so different today. I mean, today it is. is like, you know, you see one one thing goes wrong. Okay, you're ready to hit the road, Jack. You know? exactly. <laughs> well, you go, you go today, you go in with the expectation that, oh, I know I have an out. Versus back then when we were growing up in the 60s, 70s and, and 80s, even, you know, first time marriage, my parents were like, I hope, you know, marriage is forever. My parents were married for 58 years before my dad passed away. Yeah. And I mean, that's the way it was. Yes. Um, but it just still didn't work out for me with, with the first marriage. It just it just didn't. Yeah. Um, um, I mean, there are a lot of things that I talk about in the book. Um so Good. you know we don't we don't have to go through all of that now. No, but no. To answer to answer the the question about when did I know? It was when I began to defend the other woman. Mm. That's when the bell went off. That's when the wow. bell went off. That's big. What the hell are you doing? <laughs> yep. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yep. That 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 is the pivotal moment. That is a pivotal moment. I, I had a pivotal moment. It, it it was ugly, but it was pivotal because that's when I knew I wouldn't dream of going against my parents' upbringing. But at that pivotal moment, I knew I love you, mother. I love you, daddy. But I gotta go. But you know what did what did your parents say? Well, I don't think you want to know all that. They okay, started right. talking about what the Bible says. Yeah, The Bible says, because we were so religiously dysfunctional, the Bible says that you stay until death. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, the Bible also says in the case of adultery, you can leave. And for my mother family. was speechless. She didn't know what to say. She but said, you're absolutely family. correct. And that's how I was able to maintain my standing with her and i could i could be wrong but i believe in the case of adultery on the part of the, the wife the man can leave it doesn't work the other way around it was not available on the other way around well what, what wait 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 a minute jay wait are you telling me that the bible says that in the case of adultery where the wife commits adultery the man can the husband can leave but if the man commits adultery, the wife can? I believe that, is, that that's my understanding, yes. Wow. 
I could be wrong. I'm not. I'm not. If that's student. true, that's mind blowing. Not surprising to me. I mean, when I when I got divorced, um, even though I had uh, a steady job, I was working NBC, CBS. I was doing a lot of film. I was doing road work. I was working everywhere. Um, but when I got a divorce. Um, I couldn't take my credit with me. Well, mm. Whatever credit I had built stayed with the husband. The wife was not allowed to take that credit. Mm. Wow. So I had to start from zero again. But you kept your name. You I did, kept you did keep Kennedy. I kept it for a reason. Because nobody, nobody knew who Jane Harrison was. Yes. And I didn't want to dismiss 10 years of building my presence as Jane Kennedy. Yes. And that that was a I think that was a good move. I really do. But you know, I, I believe, I not believe, I know it was. Yes. Um however, when I got married the second time, and I knew that I was gonna well, that's why I got married when my doctor said you need to start a family. And I I told Bill, I said, okay, I'm ready to get pregnant. And he said, What? <laughs> I said, No, I'm really gonna get pregnant. We're gonna get married, we're gonna get pregnant, and you know, we're gonna go and do whatever, you know. And he didn't believe me. So I I took the um uh, the birth control pills, I threw them down the toilet, and he said, Okay, um, <laughs> how's this gonna work, you know? But um, there was never like, you know, let's get married or any of that type of stuff. It was just like, you know, there was a plan and we were just following the plan. Jane Kennedy is not who I am. It's just my movie name, you know, and I couldn't, I, my, I'm Jane Harrison. That's my maiden name. That's who my parents raised. I am Jane Harrison. And so I can't even use my main name, you know, because nobody knows who, no, no, no one knows who that is. So, but I did want to have my children have the same last name as I did. Mm -hmm. So here I am. I don't want to be Jane Overton because then I have to start all over again. Right. You know, can you imagine walking into a studio and saying Jane Overton at the gate and they go, yeah, right. Bye. <laughs> but, you know, so I had built this, you know, this persona and that was my calling card so it's I, your brand yeah it's your brand it's, it was Absolutely. my brand and I could not turn my back on that so then it became Jane Kennedy Overton I love that so it now flows. That, but I'm still not Harrison <laughs> which is who I really well, am well and, and you know and that's why and that's why exactly the reason I did Kathy Holloway Hill because so many people knew me as Holloway and then everybody started knowing me as Hill. When I started writing my books, I used the double name. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, with the person I'm actually married to, his name is nowhere in the equation. It's not even oh, part wow. of Kathy yeah, Holloway yeah. Hill. It's not, not even part. Mm -hmm. So I get that brand. When you build the brand, especially when you write a book and you put your name on it in a whatever name you yes, put, yeah. you've got to stay with that name because it, it becomes your brand. Yeah. So I have um, the cover will say Jane Kennedy because that's what yeah. people know. That's, that's what they're looking for. Um, when they look for it in the marketplace, they won't be looking for Jane Harrison. Yes. But on the inside of the book, it says written by Jane Harrison Kennedy Overton. And the book is written in four parts, acknowledging who I am as Jane Harrison in the beginning of the book, how I was raised, how it came to be me, Jane Kennedy, Hollywood's wife, Hollywood life, um, Jane Overton being a mom. And then the last part is playing Jane where who am I? Oh, Jane, yeah. I love that. Now, now, when will it be out? And yeah, I was asking you about your social media because I want people to oh, keep yes. up with you to, to know mm -hmm. where can they get it when it is ready. Do you, do you have any idea when it will be completed? So I got, I got distracted because I made it really simple <laughs> to find me on um, Instagram and Facebook. It's Jane Kennedy Overton. Excellent. And um, on Twitter, which I don't really do Twitter, don't like Twitter, but I'm there as plain Jane K.O. Oh, wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. That's plain awesome. Jane K O for Kennedy Overton. And, and plain plain Jane K O J A Y N E. Correct. Oh, mm -hmm. I love that. And the book won't be. I don't have a publisher yet. Um. So I'm. You know. I just finished it. Um. I have a proposal that I've been shopping for a publisher. Uh, mm -hmm. So you know the book. If you you know you know the book world. So it yes. takes a long time. Yeah. Um, so it's not going to be out this year. That's for sure. Yes. Um, hopefully yes. by mid twenty four. Well, we we'll be looking for it. That's for sure. Let me just say like this: it will definitely be out before the Olympics. <laughs> yes. Yes. I finally finished it. All of those years, I called it my living process piece. Because yes. I had to live it to start writing about that part. Yes, I absolutely. had to wait till my daughters were all out of school, mm -hmm. um, all out of college, because yes. I wanted them to go to college. I wanted so desperately to go to college, and when I didn't, I just said, "All my girls are going to go to college," you know, and they wanted to. So that was yes. easy. that was easy. Um, Good for you. Two graduated from Pepperdine. Uh, one got a master's at uh, Syracuse. One graduated from USC, um, and uh, and they've all gone on to do amazing things. Just like their beautiful mom and incredible dad. Yeah, and I am so I'm so proud of you. I'm just really proud of you. Um, so thank you. I see that big smile. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm really, but really. The, the other part of it, which I think is really important, is family. Um, um, Bill's first wife, um, Kathleen. Um, is a very good friend of mine, Aww. and um, and we have maintained that um, that our blended family is going to work from day I one. I love that. Yeah, from day one. So, like, I mean, Cheyenne just I just Cheyenne is my stepdaughter. So just today, I said, "Oh, sorry, Cheyenne, just another butt message. I'm sorry. I'm still, you know." <laughs> but you know, like, I we get together all the time. She's 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 my daughter. You know, I heard mm, she was maybe 15. And I overheard her on a conversation with a boy and she was saying something and she said, um, Bill came in the room and she said, dad. And he said, wait a minute. I thought you, didn't you say mom before? She said, yeah. And he said, oh, I thought you were at your mom's house. She said, I am. He said, but you just said dad. She said, no, no, no. I have two moms. <laughs> <laughs> And he, so said, sweet. he said, well, you have your mom. Why do you call your stepmom mom? She said, because she treats me like I'm her daughter. Mm. And man, I I overheard the conversation, so I didn't mean to be listening in. But I ran into the back and I started jumping. Yes, 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 I did something right. <laughs> then, I mean, so family is so important to me. And um, I am so proud of all my girls. They are absolutely amazing people and you can you know you hear people talk about you know I really love my kids but more than that I like them oh that's huge that's huge that is huge because very few parents can say that these days I'm very so few. and you are so so very blessed I'm very blessed that you have spent this amount of time with my viewers sharing your heart and your life and your accomplishments and your spirits and your beliefs and your loves and everything that God has blessed you with just to be able to share that and bring some brightness and hope and happiness and joy Thank you. and all of these positive emotions that we need in our lives right now today, which is why I'm so honored and so glad that you agreed to come on here and talk to my Thank viewers. You. Thank you for finding me. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I, I, I never, ever would lose track of the incredible, the one and only, Miss <laughs> Jane Kennedy. I mean, you you were my icon growing up. I tell you, I, I kept up with you. I so I'm also, I should also mention that I'm also working on a, um, a pitch for a bio doc. Um, so I'm going to do a documentary wow. film about my life, hopefully to come out the same time the book does. Um, That's incredible. And, and also working in the back of my mind on a biopic. Um, and so oh, everybody great. that I talk to, the first question they ask, you're writing a, a, a movie about yourself. And I said, yeah. 
And they said, okay, so who's going to play you? And I said, that's going to be a hell of a talent search. <laughs> I, don't, I can't find anyone. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, you're right. That will be a huge challenge for different, in my opinion, for different reasons than probably what you're thinking. But, but yeah, that's that's going to be impossible to find someone with with your level of beauty inside and out oh. and professionalism and all the attributes that you possess my goodness well i'm thinking more of being that person being able to capture who i am on the inside yes absolutely yeah. the essence of who you are which will be very important. difficult and how do you write that you know because yes the studios are going to want the grandiose yep. but you have to understand who i am to yes. understand what that grandiose means that's right. So that's right. That is so right. And you know, I, I'm going to end on this note, Jane, because I, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to fill in the blank. Okay. Jane Kennedy is. Okay. I want to fill in the blank with um, a word that was not my word, but um, everybody has used it to describe me. And they have threatened that if I don't adopt this in my soul. <laughs> that they're gonna kick me to the curb. Um, and every time someone walks up to me and says, oh my God, I loved you when I was growing up. You meant so much to me when I was growing up. My parents told me about you. My father used to sit me and my sisters in front of the TV and said, watch the NFL today because if she can do it, you can do it too. All of these people that keep coming up to me and saying things like that. And they say, Jane, because there's only one Jane Kennedy. That's why they say it. This is what my manager is saying. And now when now that he started, it's like everybody's saying it. And I'm still not comfortable with it. What is it? Um, icon. Oh, yeah. Most definitely. Jane Kennedy is an icon. Jane Kennedy is also a legend. And Jane Kennedy is also one of the most beautiful people I have ever seen. And I'm not just talking about external. I'm more so referring to internal. After this conversation and what we talked about off camera, you are everything that I knew you were. I have never met you, but you are everything oh, that so. <laughs> everything, just 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 the 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 aura, your energy around you. You don't really have to be in a person's physical presence to feel that, that aura. And and I feel that here. And that, that's who you are. You're you're one of a kind. You're unique. You were you were definitely born to stand out. You weren't born to fit in and you are definitely standing out. And I am so honored that I now mm -hmm. have had the pleasure of talking to my personal icon, my personal role model growing up, the beautiful Miss Jane Kennedy, Miss Jane Harrison Kennedy. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. How thank about you. that? You. I, I truly appreciate that. You know what I, I do? I know you, I know we're going to end, um, but it's just one more thing to say. Um, I try to please myself. I try to please my God. I try to please my parents. But at the end of the day, I always find myself trying to please my grandmother. Oh, I never knew her. Um, she was murdered when my dad was 10. And I was named after her. Um, Jane Harrison. Wow. Jane Harrison. Wow. So I just, I find myself all the time just hoping that, you know, she would be proud of me. Oh, there's no doubt. There is no fair. doubt. There's no way anyone in your family, in your circle, your loved ones, there's no way they could not be. I'm not even in your family, and I am. I'm very proud of you. And, my and I know mom. you're going to continue to do great things. You're going to continue to touch lives, change lives. My mother's oh. name is Thompson. So, you know, I tell my daughters, 
when you get married, carry your name forward with you. Yes. Because yes. otherwise it will be lost. That's you know, right. I'm, I'm a Harrison and I sign off Harrison Strong, Thompson True. That's yes. Me. I love that. I love that. Miss Jane Harrison Kennedy Overton, thank you so much for spending this time with us this evening. You are absolutely a blessing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be a part of your show. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, yes. And we were we're going to be looking for all those materials that are coming out, the book and the biopic and the memoirs and everything you're working on and Everyone, please visit our social media and keep up with this beautiful, iconic legend. Keep up with her to make sure that you're on track with everything that she's going to be releasing in her release dates. Thank you so much for joining us for this incredible episode, this incredible conversation with this legendary, beautiful icon. We thank you so much, and we'll be seeing you same time next week with another empowering episode. Good night, everyone.